everybody, and welcome to Untether.tv. I'm your host, Rob Woodbridge, and the founder. Well, a couple of years ago, I interviewed this company at the outset of what they were doing. They just raised a little bit of money. They were uh, setting out there and, uh, and about to launch their service, or just had launched their service. And I got to ask you a question. What would you do with customers like CBS, like Disney, like Dove, X Factor, American Idol, the NFL, ESPN, the Weather Channel, and Suzuki? Man, you would die for clients like that. Well, that's what our next guest's company has managed under his tenure, all within the last two years. They've done it helping bridge the gap between traditional media and our phones with a company called Zoov and a product called Star Star. Oh, and they've also raised just a small amount of money, around $40 million during that time as well. With me today to talk about what he's done at Zoov is the president and CEO, Joe Gillespie. Joe, man, thank you for doing this. I'm glad we could finally connect. We've got a good connection. How are things? Things are good. Things are good, Rob. How are things with you? Very, very, very good. I'm glad we could do this. Uh, Joe is in New York. He, he's there, a Silicon Valley or uh, Northern California, where he says the weather is perfect. Northern California based based company. Um, Joe, thanks for doing this. I really appreciate you coming on and sharing this story again. It's a great to do a follow up a couple of years later to see how the company has progressed. So, for those people who don't know what Zoov is or Star Star, why don't we just kind of get that over with? Talk about what what you guys do, and then we'll get into what's changed and the impact of what you guys have been doing with some of these huge brands. So we'll start there. What is Zoof? Yeah, Zoof, basically, we're managing a new mobile namespace on behalf of all of the major U.S. carriers. Our namespace starts with the Star Star, and it's basically simply call Star Star on any mobile device on AT&T, T-Mobile, Verizon, and Sprint. And through a simple phone call, Star Star followed by Star Star ESPN, Star Star DD for Dunkin' Donuts, Star Star, uh, Lexus, we can move any digital asset to any mobile device, feature phone and or smartphone. And to your earlier point, the problem that we're solving, we actually think we are finally figured out a way to, at scale, drive offline to online engagement. And, uh, you know, for most, most brands today, I think really are starting to view mobile less in the context of the device and more in the context of the fact that we now have the anywhere consumer who 24 by 7 is ubiquitously connected to the internet, and therein lies the opportunity to engage consumers on their terms anytime they're out in the real world. And with our use case, we think it's A, dead simple. You simply call, no change in user behavior, nothing to download, nothing to scan. Everybody from 7 to 70 knows how to make a phone call. And again, whether it's uh, an app, a coupon, a video, doesn't matter. Any digital asset, we can move by the text path. So when you call a, a code, if you were here in the U.S., unfortunately, we're not live in Canada yet. I'll get to that later. <laughs> it's coming. But if you simply call Star Star ESPN as an example, or actually, let's go back to Star Star NFL, which we're about to renew and actually be on all the NFL games uh, coming up this season. Through that simple phone call on any phone, on any carrier, we can actually move the NFL football app uh, from Verizon to your device. And when you call it, the first thing you, it'll, the phone will answer, hey, thanks for calling Star Star NFL. You'll feel the text message actually hit the phone simultaneously. You'll go to your text, you'll click on that link, and as I said, we can navigate the consumer to literally any digital asset they market to be one uh, to put them against. So this is, when you start to think about the changes that have happened over the last couple of years, um, you know, certainly you've come on, you came on in when, 2010? Is that uh, roughly when you, you entered? Yeah, that's right. Your, your background is is broadcast, isn't it? Yeah, part actually, <laughs> I've been very fortunate. I've actually lived just about on every platform, beginning with uh, college radio. But let's not go back there in detail, <laughs> shall we? <laughs> but I started in print. I had the good fortune to work for Ziff Davis, uh, and literally joined that company at the start of the PC revolution. I'm going to date myself back in the 1980s. And then from there, we, uh, we uh, created a television channel called ZDTV, which uh, eventually I co-founded into Tech TV with Paul Allen, the co-founder of Microsoft. Actually, that's what moved me from New York to, uh, to San Francisco. I sold that business to Comcast and then got lucky again and went to work for Shelby Bonney and the, and the great folks at CNET. And I ran CNET.com for about six years. And then Leslie Moonves and CBS Television bought CNET, you might recall, in 2008. And then I took on the CBS News uh, properties, the digital properties, uh, for, for Leslie and uh, Sean McManus, the president of CBS News. And the point of all that context, Rob, is that I know firsthand the pain points of trying to drive offline to online. Because if you think about the acquisition of, of CBS as an example of CNET, the promise there and the belief was 
that you could use television to move, you know, uh, consumers at scale onto CNET, which was a highly profitable site and still is to this day. Uh, but the truth is, it's very difficult. It's just a lot of friction. And we think mobile, uh, in fact, I think at this point we know mobile is just, it's really disruptive and it makes it really simple. And on the consumer's terms, I mean, I think that's really the most important part about mobile is you're not, you're not tethered, <laughs> to use one of your terms, and it's truly allowing allowing consumers when they're in the moment to say, you know what, I want that, I like that, I want to engage with that content, and they can have a digital experience right on that phone. And we're, we're going to come back to that, but I, I got to just dive a little bit deeper into into your, your background, because uh, what was it about, uh, you know, Zoov th that brought you into this space? You, you know, you say you've, you've, you, you saw the, the challenges, but what was it specifically about Zoov? Many other companies yeah. are trying to fight this or trying to... Uh, you know, help with this challenge. But what was it about Zoov? <laughs> That's a great question. And I'll, I'll answer it by telling you a story. So when I left CBS at the end of 2009, I was literally going to basically take a little bit of retirement, some time off, it was six months to 12 months. And I've always had the good fortune to work in the tech space. So I literally walked out very much with a venture capitalist mindset. And there were two areas of particular interest for me. One was mobile and the other was software as a service. Those were two areas that I had particular interest because I saw tremendous growth and enormous disruption happening because you know the mobile revolution you know the internet revolution was before that the PC revolution was before that so I knew these were the woods I was gonna hunt in and it just so happens a dear friend of mine a guy named Barry Briggs is a former president of CNET he calls me and he says you know this is crazy company that's been on the launch pad for seven years I'm like why wouldn't I run the other way <laughs> you really got to meet these guys and I went down and I met with Tim Jemison, the founder, who's now my chief operating officer. And as I said to my wife, he had me at Star Star Hello. <laughs> That's great. I spent 25 years of my life trying to demystify technology for consumers. And I learned firsthand simplicity equals scale, scale equals success. And, you know, frankly, the challenge I put forth to Tim is at the time he only had AT&T. And I said, Tim, this is a great idea, but why the hell would the elephants dance around you? You know, AT&T, T-Mobile, Verizon, and Sprint hate each other. They compete vehemently. So I don't understand, you know, why you think you're going to be able to convince these guys to basically, you know, circle and rally around your platform and your use case. So to be quite honest, Rob, I, I didn't take the job right away. They offered it to me right away. I spent seven months trying to break the model, talking to marketers, talking to ad agencies, talking to the carriers. And the, and the most interesting aspect of the early due diligence from the carriers were, they said, Joe, look, at the end of the day, we believe fundamentally in the use case because it is so simple and there's so little friction. And we know what friction is associated with things like QR codes and SMS vanity codes, and we just haven't seen the scale there that we thought we would. So with that as you know, a fundamental testimonial, if you will, coming from the carriers, I thought, all right. And then when I went out to brands, <laughs> Rob, I've literally had CMOs after I explained what we do and how we do it. They literally said to me, Joe, you're the first guy I've ever met in mobile. I actually understand what the frick you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> it's really simple. You can do this. You know? so, anyway, so that's that really it was the, the fundamental simplicity. And in addition to that, I should point out, Zoo is a lot more than a pretty simple UI. We're also a very, very powerful platform. So when you lease a code from us, our, our, our IP actually sits at what's called the SS7 layer for all the carriers. And we have an ad platform and a content management system that in real time lets you track how many calls am I generating, what carrier they come from, what handset. And we also, by the way, get location data on every single dialing event on a non-opt-in basis. And then we have a content management system that lets partners like you know, Good Morning America, who we just signed up this week uh, at ABC Television in New York, where GMA decided in the morning, the first hour of the programming, Star Star GMA, you get a Starbucks coupon. And then the second hour, they have a completely different digital experience. And the beauty is the CMS that we built gives them the ability to change what digital asset they're pointing to. They can do it every 15 minutes if they want it. it yeah, it's obviously very versatile what we're talking about here. And, and you know, there are there are alternatives, right? There are things like, as you said, um, you know, QR codes and, and uh, there's hashtags that, you know, what we saw with, um, you know, American Idol uh, through texting. Um and, uh, you know, there's a couple of companies that, that I know very, very well that, that have, you know, pound uh, equivalents that they're instead of the star star. Um, but it, it just it just resonates. You find it a challenge to, to rebuild that kind of thinking, like in, instead of pound, whatever, you're, you're actually hitting uh, star star. Is that was that a challenge or was that just it was so simple that people just, you know, you dismissed that as a as a challenge. 
Well, actually, that's a great question. I thought it, it was less of a challenge and more of an opportunity <laughs> in the sense that, you know, I've, I've lived on the bleeding edge <laughs> and you do bleed on the bleeding edge. It was great. You know, some others had trailblazed before us, right? In fact, I said to many of an investor, if you want proof, are we hunting a huge issue and problem? Look no further than all the ads you see that today look like NASCAR race cars. They got more freaking logos in them. Yeah. Twitter ads, Facebook buttons, URLs. They're all, they're all aiming for the same thing. How do we drive engagement with the consumer against that analog asset? So in many ways, um, we appreciate the work and, and frankly, the success that SMS text and QR codes have had and, and, and the web has had in terms of you know, driving engagement. We just frankly think we do it better. And, and, and it's good to have those benchmarks because when we go in, customers literally say, we'd love to test this. No one said no, by the way, to, uh, to Zoom. I've been here two years. At the, at the very least, they're willing to pilot with us. Hey, let's go figure out if this will work better. And invariably they do. They find it because, you know, take QR as an example. You can't scan a QR code on radio. <laughs> right, right. And you can't scan it 60 miles an hour on a mobile. So one of the first things that people appreciate about Star Star is that we work literally on any asset. It can go on a can of Coke. It can go on a radio spot. And probably the most important thing, it's Star Star, my brand. It's not some icon that has no relationship to who I am and what I represent. It's Star Star Coke. It's Star Star ESPN. And then, of course, we have the added uh, benefit of 30 to 40 years of learned behavior on 1-800 phone numbers and the memorability and the efficacy of you know 1-800 Dell as an example. So it's a, it's a great question. Uh, I find it's been more helpful than hurtful to have those that have come before us uh, and to have that context with a marketer to say, we, we welcome the opportunity to be benchmarked. And you know, in anticipation of your next question, Rob, I never rec really don't ever recommend that anybody displace, you know, don't put a URL in an ad or a Facebook logo. Um, we think, you know, there's probably a, a, a limit to how many options you want to give uh, a, a, an average consumer to engage in that. Uh, but right now, I think for the most part where we are, I think we're highly complimentary. You know, I'm just I'm pulling up your website here because I think that uh, what what you just struck me was was so important. Uh, you know, this has been a, a Gary Vaynerchuk challenge as well, which is uh, don't put the Facebook logo on your ads, don't put a Twitter logo on your ads. Drive them to one location and then engage with them there. From that point, you might want to send you know create an awareness that you're, you're there's a Facebook page. But it always strikes me as as an incredible waste of effort if you are going to, you know, a QR code is an unbranded piece of, uh, you know, goo on a website that doesn't really reinforce your brand. Um, so to, what you guys are doing is so effective when it comes to uh, reinforcing the brand, reinforcing that just drive them to one location, have one specific outcome that you want to achieve from that interaction and then measure that and if it's not working change it that's ultimately what you guys can do that's right that's spot on and I'll, I'll give you a use case so let's go back to uh, star star dd for dunkin donuts a, a great partner here out of canton mass so dunkin actually ran a, a big campaign for uh, men in black three with will smith and it was a brand campaign on television and if you simply call star star dd you can get your kids this really fun uh, men in black app and the reason I bring this one up, because it goes back to your point, Rob, it's, it's not that we're directing people into the, you know, the ether of the Internet. We are in a very hyper-targeted way, dropping them right on the digital asset you want them to engage in. So take DD. If, if you were here right now, and we were sitting around, and we had like four or five people at a conference table, one had a BlackBerry on Verizon, the other one had an Android phone on Sprint, the other one had an AT&T iPhone, and the other one had, you name it, and we all dialed star star DD simultaneously, every single one of those people would not only wind up in the right app environment, they wind up on the landing page with one click. They can then uh, load that app onto the page. And what makes that possible is that every time somebody calls star star, when it hits our network, we recognize the discrete phone number, the carrier, and the handset type. So we know, don't send them to the Android store, send them to the Apple store, right to that specific landing page. And if you talk to anybody in app, development, deployment of mobile, they'll tell you the number, they, there's two issues, app discoverability and apathy. App discoverability, is just you can get so lost, as you know, to your point, you go to the front door of the iTunes store, <laughs> you're running a huge risk that that person's ever going to find your app. How many apps are on the iTunes store? Um, so anyway, yeah, the hyper-targeted piece, we think, is a real, real advantage. 
And to your point too, you get to test it. If all of a sudden you see low engagement, you say, swap it out. Let's, uh, let's see if we can enhance the experience in some way or another. Well, I mean, that, that's, a, that's a great example of it. But, uh, and, and you're also working with, as I said, some of the biggest brands, American Idol being one of them on this latest tour, X Factor, Dove, Disney, CBS. Um, but, you know, it, it would, what is considered a win for this? You know, because this is a highly measurable thing. Actually, before we go there, because this yeah. is a highly measurable tool, right? So Star Stars, you just said, you, you know, um, you, you are measuring everything. Analytics are this are deep. What happens when, uh, is there... How do you sell this? Is there an expectation that you levy? Because it's not a mass broadcast thing. It's not like you're trying to get to a million people and you hope 10,000 buy. It's like you're trying to get to the right 10,000 and convert them all. Is it a different sell? It is a different sell. Um, and I can start with, initially it's a conceptual sell. Uh, customers very quickly grok that this feels like a better mousetrap to me. So there, we have context, as I said earlier. You know, we're, not, we're not inventing the wheel here. Um, we're actually addressing a problem that brands uh, in all categories have been trying to solve for decades. You know, you can go back even to the birth of the web. How do we drive offline to online? That helps a lot. And then when they start to understand that, wait a minute. So when you really think about Zoov, you're pretty much the largest MSO on the planet because you address 260 million people, regardless of device and regardless of carrier. There aren't very many 260 million addressable audiences in the world, Rob, as you know. So that usually gets us in the door where they go, oh, geez, why wouldn't I you know, at least explore this? But the, the fundamental question then is, when we get with the marketer, there's a blessing and curse to what we've created. Zoov can do everything. <laughs> there's a conundrum because there's so many different ways you can use it. So our, usually our, our first approach with a major brand is let's go find a problem that you're trying to solve offline to online and let's go execute against it. And then we coach them on things like, look, at the end of the day, what defines success? The quality of the content asset and the media weight you put behind it. That's the bottom line. It sounds fundamental, but many miss it you know, because we say to them, okay, so you want the user to click on what? You know, Come on, put yourself in their shoes. What is it that's going to motivate them to take their phone out, call your brand, right, and say, I like that. I want that asset onto my phone. And a little later on, if you'd like, I can go through some use cases that where the brands really killed it. And the, su the success metrics fundamentally really come in two ways. One is comparative. You know, they've had experiences with SMS and QR and went and trying to drive web traffic. And invariably, they find better results with us. The second is when they're all of a sudden realizing, well, wait a minute, I'm getting click uh, data against platforms I've never seen click data before. So we have outdoor billboard advertisers are saying, Joe, you're telling me, you can tell me that my billboard on the west side of Manhattan is driving more clicks than my billboard on the east side, right? <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, we actually can. They're like, that's crazy. So, you know, so for some it's brand new and we're literally making it up as we go along in terms of what are successful metrics. And then in other cases, more times than not, this comparative data to look back historically and say, you know, we've attempted to do this in the past and here's how Zoob or Star Star, if you would, uh, stood up to, you know, what we've done uh, in the past. I mean, it's pretty incredible. I mean, the amount of data that they can, you can influence their their decisions, and and uh, and certainly for the first time in, well, I mean, I think forever, um, you are actually measuring. It's not just about location, location, location. It's about effectiveness, right? So that when you're bridging that gap between the real world and the digital world, um, you, you now you're getting the answers that people have been craving for forever. Uh, when they put up billboards or when they've done some kind of print campaign, you can actually it's measurable, and uh, that's, right. that's that's an incredible incredibly liberating thing. Um, I mean, have people been making decisions about, you know, taking billboards down? I don't want to destroy the billboard industry, but but they've obviously been making decisions about where they are now pushing uh, their advertising and their awareness making as a result of something like Zoof. Have you seen that happening? Yes, we have. We've seen creative be influenced, and I'll come back to that. We've seen media buying changed as a result of use of our platform. And while I'm, I'm not allowed to, I, I'm not at this point, I can give you specific data from a specific client, let me give you just a few examples. An unnamed brand was actually running local television and they were able to show on our platform what local TV stations were driving more engagement. First time ever, right? That's incredible. Or we've had you know, brands like uh, last year, uh, Verizon, one of our uh, most strategic, one of our uh, uh, really strategic partners ran Star Star NFL during the NFL season last year. And with their ad agency, we were able to demonstrate with just slight changes on the creative, you know, not just Star Star, it's simply call Star Star. 
or they have the announcer do a voiceover while the banner pops up on the bottom, we could see literally call rates go up three, four, five X in real time. So it can do, it can have creative influence, to your point in real time. And it can also have what I call media attribution. You know, it's like, wow, we can actually now see, you know, what, you know, what's the, what's the local attribution we're getting from, you know, spot radio as an example or television. That that to me is is uh, is one of the biggest things, and and I, I think that the that shift in in the way that people are now spending their money and and creating or, or trying to create awareness with these tools because it's so measurable, um, I, that that shift is happening where people are are now not thinking mass broadcast, they're thinking micro broadcast. As, to your point about driving, you know, an iPhone user to the appropriate spot in order to be able, it's different from uh, from an Android user because that's you know that's just that's just common sense. You'd expect that to happen. Um, and right, right. you're taking that out of the hands of everybody else and, and you're making it as simple as possible to interact with a brand. So uh, I, I love that. I love that completely. What about, um, you, you know, some of these big wins, we've talked about these things, uh, you, you know, you are, um, there's a star star for American Idol. There's uh, X Factor, Dove, uh, CBS. Uh, you said the NFL, we've got a great list on the website. What have, what have been some of the wins, like some of these major customers, what, they've come back to you with, with successes. I mean, what do you have, can you, can you enlighten us to some of these? Yeah, absolutely. And and again, I go back to, um, it, it, I love coming to work every day, Rob, because every day I come to work, our customers are teaching us ways to use our platform we didn't even think of. That's great. It really is. It's kind of it's got a lot of that open API feel that I had when I was at CNET. But a couple of uh, examples: Electronic Arts and Star Star Matt uh, last year, EA, great for, you know brand, great marketing innovator, came to us and said, "Look, we want to." We want to launch Star Star, use Star Star Madden to download these apps, et cetera. And they came to us with a great idea. And I think it was just prior to Thanksgiving last year, for 48 hours, they gave, if you simply called Star Star Madden, by the way, John Madden answered the call. Hey, this is John Madden. Thanks for calling Electronic Arts, Star Star Madden. And for 48 hours, anybody who called that number got Madden 2012 for their mobile phone for free. Wow. And the only, and the only way they promoted it was on Facebook. And I got to tell you, it lit our network up like a Christmas tree. <laughs> Why do you think that? Just because it was free, is that uh, obviously? Called, yeah, exactly. Free, free works. <laughs> free is effective. Yeah, and it's a great game. <laughs> it's a quality product, right? So you know, and it was just a great way, like a lost leader, if you will, to drive a lot of viral activity. And so I use it just as an example where you know everybody thought, wow, here's a quality asset. Let's drive a ton of engagement. And believe me, they continued to see traffic and purchase even after that. In fact, we know that uh, not only did people go into the Vcast environment, Verizon, and get the free app, there was a very high attachment rate of people buying other apps when they were in that environment. So that was just one example. The NFL was another one. You know, with the NFL, Star Star NFL, the buzz on that was great. But again, it's a quality asset. I don't know if you've seen the Verizon NFL app. It's it's white hot. It's, it's a fantastic product. So that, you know, you get wins like like that Dunkin Donuts was a lot of fun you know the Men in Black app was fun on people hey, I'll give it a shot we've done things like um, uh, gas station TV a partner that we have up in Detroit these guys are killing it they have a, a TV network that sits atop gas pumps in the US and they ran a contest where they gave away $50 gift certificates of free gas and then I think the ultimate winner won a uh, gas for a year and in that case uh, what they realized is that our network can actually identify the nth caller so we're we're going to be a big hit with radio stations here, Rob, because it's literally we can identify the hundredth caller, the thousandth caller, the ten thousand caller, and through a simple phone call, they were able to give away gas, and it just drove a tremendous amount of call volume and repeat call volume because people could enter as many times as they wanted. So there, you know, there there are stunts that you can do, there are quality assets you can do, there's scarcity that you can put into the environment, which is one of my favorite. It, it has that, for lack of a better way to describe it, that Groupon. This this deal is not going to last forever. You know, capability because you know to your point before, we can turn a deal or a digital asset on and off. You know, pretty much in real time. Um, but the best ones, I think, the most fun have been when the brands really think strategically, or I should say, tactically around what is the what is it I'm asking the consumer to do in what environment, and you know, and really think about that and say, okay, what's the likelihood that of them saying I'm going to simply call Star Star DD? Yeah. I, I I love that I love the scarcity play right uh, be, because it it, it um, all these examples that you've you've, you've just ex explained especially the the one around a um, uh, a gas pump 
to me, it, uh, these things are are um, are stellar because you got idle time. Um, and is that is that what you're trying to do? Is you're trying to I think people are driving down the highway, they got a billboard, they're in a magazine, they want to interact with this. There's other ways to do this, but but really, is it about idle time usage, and then you put a kind of a a level of um, of uh, you know a deep level of a time frame around something like this that is a contest or something to that extent that that really drives us or, or what are you finding that 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 is being very successful for for these clients i think it's a it's it's a combination of yeah idle time but it's also a, uh, an issue of utilitarian value utility so imagine you know a major bank owning star star atm and anywhere in the u.s i can basically send them the addresses of the four closest atms yeah or imagine Star Star AA for American Airlines, and because you've given me on a second opt-in basis the permission to uh, to match your mobile phone number to your American Express or American Airlines profile, I can download a uh, a boarding pass to your phone. So it, I think there's a there's an opportunity to do both. Uh, uh, well, well, actually, three things: one, idle time; two, is more engagement. Hey, hit Star Star GMA and get four minutes of the Barack Obama interview that didn't make our air, right? Right, because you. Want information so i can deepen the content experience and you're deepening and the, the brand other, you're deepening the brand engagement at that point right you're, you're identifying a customer or identifying a, a deeper fan or uh, giving them an opportunity to engage further with with something that they would never have been able to engage with before that's right and making it super convenient meaning let's you know start start 60 minutes has been a great part for us for, for about a year year and a half and they have a product called 60 overdrive and it's literally a, uh, a whole other 60 minutes on the making of 60 minutes. and it's been on their website for a long time and with Star Star 60 you can literally be sitting on your couch and they put a banner up and say would you like to see the making of the Steve Croft piece and the beauty of it Rob is you don't gotta get off the couch you don't need to go to your computer you literally go yeah I, I know that mobile phone is right next to the other remote control just hit Star Star 60 and we'll send the clip to your phone uh, I love that I love that I, I also look at this and say that, you know, in an interactive media world where, uh, you know, I believe that DVDs are going going to disappear because of high broadband activity and cloud activity and what Apple's doing. Um, all of a sudden, you can start to integrate this into other media forms. So you've got it on television. You can do this on a DVD, you know, Star Star, Lord of the Rings, LOR. Then all of a sudden, you, you can you can download extras and, and behind the scenes activity or bloopers from from that. Is that is that do you see? Do you foresee that happening? Yeah, in fact, we did. We uh, we actually ran a campaign with Pepsi for Brisk, and it ran on a PS3 uh, Star Wars game. It's Star Star Wars nice. was the code that they put. <laughs> nice. And uh, it, it, was, it was exactly as you described. It was an in-game ad that popped up. And I, I could have this wrong. I think it was additional tips and tricks on how to get more functionality out of the game. Yeah. But it worked very, very well. And it proved your point, which is that this, this thing, people would rather lose their wallet than lose their mobile phone, right? We, we have this with us all the time. And that, to me, is the, is the real uh, use case issue to be thinking around mobile. It's the intimacy. It's the in-the-moment capability of having this phone in your possession at all times that really, I think, should have content creators and programmers and brands thinking in that context and how can I, to your point, satisfy them in idle time, drive more engagement, give them more utility. Um, it's, a, it's a game changer. Real game changer. What about what about numbers when it comes to you know volume of these? You probably don't disclose the the actual. Uh, obviously, I'm not asking for client numbers here. Sure. But but I mean, are we talking you know uh, trends over the last two years? Obviously, you've seen this. Your numbers shoot up. You, you've been able to secure some investment. You're getting some of the big brands, so the, the impact is there. But but I mean I mean, do you have a highest number call volume time frames those kind of things that this is that 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 uh, you've been able to uh, to generate as a result of a of a good campaign? Yeah, let me answer that uh, three ways. One, we have continued to see quarter over quarter substantial growth sequentially in call volume on the platform, and that's obviously as a result of the fact we just we have more customers and more campaigns uh, driving it. And I can tell you the call volumes they can range from anywhere from the hundreds of thousands of calls to as little as 500 to you know 250 calls, depending again on what's the asset and what was the media wave put behind it. I will tell you that relatively speaking, we usually are seeing much higher numbers, as I said, from a CTA, a call to action standpoint, than brands have historically seen with other CTAs. So we're really encouraged that you know, when we're looked at comparatively, we, we score very, very well. 
we believe we've not had a voting uh, event as an example to date. So we have Star Star Idol. Thank you for mentioning that. Very excited about it. You call it, by the way, and Philip Phillips, the winner of American Idol, answers the call. And it is to send you the tour information for their summer tour. But, you know, uh, the, the North Star for Zoo will be to also start getting voting on uh, national television programs like X Factor. And as you probably know, those calling events measure in the millions instantly because, you know, if people are voting. You're talking about in bursts of five or ten minutes. Now, having said that, our platform is industrial strength. You know, what took seven years and $40 million, to your point, was building, you know, very scalable IP that has survived the SLAs from the carriers, which you know are told to both you and I. <laughs> yes. I, I, that voting piece, I think, is 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 very important. You know, it certainly is. Be, as these devices become much more of our identifier, right? Like, you know, I'm the only one ultimately that can get one of these through my ID. And as we as we move this into a digital identification and and this whole concept of the e-wallet, do you see how, how do you see that progressing for you guys when it comes to commerce or enabling commerce or or doing that thing where I can I can quite literally vote. In a in a real election, a by election, a local election, a national election, do, do you start to think that far down the road, or do you do you have to pull back and think, okay, one step at a time, one step at a time? We're 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 facilitating the marketing exchange and awareness exchange, but do you start to think about enabling commerce and enabling that kind of real voting power from these devices? Yeah, you can't help it. Yeah, <laughs> it's right there. You absolutely do. I will say though, as a, as a a CEO of a startup, it's all about focus, 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 right? Good answer. Um, Good answer, Joe. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you just, you can't resist it. So you do, we do, we spend a lot of time in it, some of our spare time, I should say, you know, blue skying because there are, you're right, you know, the whole e-wallet, you know, e-commerce play. I, I will give you one, uh, again, an example of a, a partner coming to us and giving us a way to think about our platform that we never thought of before. And they, they said, you know, Joe, when you think about the data that you're identifying in every call, there's an authentication opportunity with this platform, right? Absolutely. Where, you know, we know who Rob is. We know Rob's with that carrier. We know Rob lives in that area. So I was like, wow, that's a whole. And then uh, yet another example. So right now, Rob, we're going to market primarily uh, from a marketing perspective and using the platform and the use case to to drive engagement in marketing campaigns. Right. The flip side of that is, is is CRM and customer relationship management. So, you know, we spend a lot of time thinking about, you know, wouldn't it be really neat if we could test when you do star star or Dell and you put a call into a call center, we can reduce the amount of time the operators on the phone because we have a bimodal use case where they can send data back to the consumer. Yeah. And by the way, I'm making this up. We haven't tried Right this yet, but when I think about that, we go, boy, there's a whole other way to think about how would you use the use case, you know, beyond just marketing, but also around customer relationship management. I, I mean, I, I think it's incredible. Uh, gym memberships, uh, you know, identification, as you said, uh, you know, payments. Like you start to look at the complexity of the payment systems right now, and the confusion around, you know, um, around the multiple, uh, as we talk about this, kind of like e-wallet systems that are out there, and, and uh, Visa and ISIS and PayPal, and and uh, and you're, you're even into iTunes. And and wouldn't it be great if you could just authenticate? Um, by something like a star star code and based on the fact that listen my identifiers are already on this device everything else just flows through I don't care how I get paid I just use use star star whatever and and uh, I, I could be standing in Starbucks and I go star star SB or whatever it is and um, the payment is, is automatically debited I don't have to download an app it's it's seamless that transaction has to be like that and and who knows this could be an enabler when I walk into a gym I can just go you know star star my gym name and that they know that it's geofenced and I'm in that location and that's my identification I don't have to show any ID to get in those kind of things are pretty incredible I don't want to I don't want to distract but when your mind gets going the potential is pretty incredible that's right because you start to think again about that the mobile device it, just in a different context, yeah. you know. All right. So let, let's bring it back down to the the brands that are that are using this now, and the people and the companies that are using this now. This is this is a this is an expense, and, and you know you've got a modified uh, a pricing a table that I've thrown up a couple of times. And if you want to go and take a look at it, go to zoove.com or starstar.com, starstar.co. Um, but what? Uh, how have companies like um, been able to market these things? Like, I think that there's a traditional sense. You put it up on the billboard. You put it up in the magazines on, on your ads. Um, how how else have they been doing this? How how have they created awareness for for star their their own star star uh, uh, code? 
Yeah, they, uh, both analog and digital. So we have uh, customers that promote it online, Facebook, Twitter, the website. Uh, to your point, outdoor, radio, we literally have every platform. You might have saw on the site, we actually had Star Star Swim, which was in the Sports Illustrated swimsuit issue back in February, uh, which was one of our, our biggest you know, uh, print campaigns uh, thus far. Uh, but the, the answer is literally on every platform. In fact, we were even on the DirecTV blimp over at Detroit Tigers game, I think about eight, nine months ago. And you know, so they're, they're testing it. I think what we found, Rob, is that the, the, two, the two best mediums for driving call volume are by far television and radio. Is that funny? Radio are just great. Yeah, it's just you know they have large scale audiences, um, and yeah. Anyway, it's just it's been incredible the amount of volume that we've seen off of network, local TV, and uh, national and local radio. Well, uh, you, you know, some people say that uh, that traditional media is dead, right? And and uh, that's what that's what we've heard quite a bit of time. And, and uh, however, I mean, I think I would say that uh, probably newspaper ads or something to that extent as well. It's a perfect extension of the ad. Um, rather than a QR code, because you, you don't have to scan it or download anything. You just have to go and, and hit a star star. But um, traditional media like that is, is driving activity. I love that fact. Uh, yeah, it is. It is. You know, and I think, I think frankly, uh, people who think traditional media is dead is naive. Um, <clears throat> we've been saying that for a very, very long time. Yes, as long um, as it's been alive. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's uh, there's – anyway, so yeah, it, it has been really great to see – that we can, you know, allow uh, analog media to become clickable, where you can actually engage in it digitally. All right, so we we've had a good conversation around uh, around what you guys do, some of the examples of the brands that have been doing it, and uh, and how they're they're marketing it, and some of the results, um, you know, and certainly the, the product itself, uh, Star Star, and and um, uh, th this has been great. I, I got to know though, and we've we've actually blue skied a little bit around where this industry is going or could end up going. Who knows? And nobody can predict this. But when you when you look in the short horizon for what you guys are doing. Two years you've evolved to this point. What do you see as where is this industry moving towards? Uh, is it moving into the commerce side? Is it staying in the marketing side for quite some time? Um, is is it ex extending into the CRM side? I, I mean, when you look at your next immediate step, what what are you guys thinking? Is is where you guys are heading? I would say all the above, but <laughs> you know, that everything you said, I think, is all within the art of the possible and will become. It's an eventuality, right? Because the the, the the value is there, the customer needs are there, right? And the capabilities are there. It's the perfect alignment. But I would say for us, because sequencing is key. I mean, your head explodes when you think about all, all the ways you can you yes. can leverage this platform. And, 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 and we very intentionally, Rob, when we went to market on the marketing side, we went to media first, then we went to brands. And the logic train there was, you know, when you sell an ABC or you're selling an ESPN or a CBS, guess what? They have massive surface area to promote these codes. Because my primary mission right now, I got to propagate this use case at scale. So the next time, should you invite me back, I'm sitting here and we're talking about Star Star, and it's as common as a 1 800 number in WWW, in the, you know, in the, in the, in the, in the, the public awareness, if you will. Because the other thing I love about Zoom is we're propagating our, our, our use case on our customers' money. It's their media that's promo you know, promoting Star Star. So, you know, marketing and media are critically important to us from a sequencing standpoint. But then in the very near future, you're going to see a lot more activity for us on the CRM and authentication side. Because I just think there's a, there's a, you know, that's when I call on the CTO, not the CMO. Right. We need to say, hey, look, I know what your pain points are. And we all know mobile's everywhere. I mean, mobile is the game changer. In fact, I, I was reading the other day, I think it was at PayPal. Their CEO literally put a mandate down corporate wide, mobile first from a product development standpoint. When you think about that, you go, wow, there isn't an aspect of a business that shouldn't be affected by, uh, you know, by mobile. And it won't be, and that's that, that's what we're seeing. Is it you know eventually it, it kind of morphs into something called pervasive computing, or it, it moves into something that that is you know mobile is just a is no longer a term. What it becomes is just uh, ubiquity, ubiquitous computing, and and uh, and we get into the machine to machine stuff. But, but um, do you think that clients for you, um, best suited clients for you right now, are people with an audience? Is that who you think would benefit the best from from uh, from Zoov and from Star Star, or is it is it companies building new brand, new awareness, trying to uh, launch a product? Where do, where do you guys fit? 
think, you know, it, for, from a self-serving standpoint, <laughs> we'd like to go with those that, again, have not large audience, but probably more importantly, uh, um, massive surface area to promote code. Distribution. Like, so, yeah, so, yeah. Yeah, it's like a retailer. Like, you know, we love Dunkin' Donuts because they have thousands of stores, right. you know. Right. So I get excited thinking about Star Star on every single cop at Dunkin' Donuts. Or, you know, you've got a 60 Minutes, it's got millions of people tuning in on a Sunday night. You know, you, that's irresistible, right? You go after those. And, and, and plus, you, you, you couldn't ask for better endorsement and testimonials. And you've got world-class brands dedicating their media assets to the code because they're trying to get their consumers to engage. Right. But the truth is, Rob, we can work, I think, as effectively for a local dry cleaners and a pizza parlor as we can for a major U.S. brand. Yeah. But the fact is, right now, we're focused primarily on national. And by the way, that's a whole other area uh, that you're going to hear more from us as we get into the second half of 2012, is how do we start taking a code, like, example, Star Star Pizza, and I can geofence that down to uh, a zip code right. and read that code you know, a thousand different times. So local's got a whole other aspect. But it just, you know, it, what happens is what fundamentally makes the platform work and powerful really doesn't change uh, based on the size of the, the market or the business issue. It, 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 keep, it keeps coming back to quality of content asset and the media and the effectiveness of the creative you're putting out there. I couldn't agree with you more. And I love the fact that, uh, you, you know, that uh, location-based or geofenced uh, uh, fits into you guys very very clearly is that that's got to be part of your strategy as you said like as you you've gone national you are you are using location as a way to engage with a customer who hits a star star brand of whatever you're gathering that information that must give you great insight about um you know hot spots where you should be targeting and then when you do get the generic brands like star star pizza star star whatever and and then you can you can bring that down to a local level. How does that play, you know expand on that a little bit? How does that play into you, to your future strategy? Because that's a revenue generator for you. It might cost too much for some companies, you know you know to have to own Star Star Pizza or but but when they you start to segment into their into their their cities or their neighborhoods, all of a sudden that becomes affordable and it, and it can benefit them. That's correct. You, you got two advantages to it. You can dramatically reduce the out-of-pocket because you're basically sub-licensing a code, a generic as we call it, uh, into a local area. But I'll give you one example. We have a great client in Simon Malls and Simon is the largest retail mall owner in the United States. And if you simply call Star Star Mall anywhere in the United States, it will bring you a content experience against the mall that's closest to where you're standing. So, And that's a product and a set of services we love when they realize, wow, that's that's contextually relevant built on location. Or you know, take a, take a Dunkin' Donuts. I'm, I'm hoping the dream with them is, and they're already recognizing this, that you know, somebody could call Star Star DD in Boston, and somebody could call it New York, and they'll get a different donut experience. Because as you know, the franchisees, the menus aren't the same everywhere, mm -hmm. right? So local flavor and, and color they put on things. So yeah, the location mm -hmm. abilities and the ability to, to literally personalize and target the content experience again against phone number carrier device and location is a big opportunity for us and our partners to really think about what are we all after we're all after how do i delight the freaking consumer when they make that period and to your earlier point rob it's you know i used to call it statefulness you know one of the reasons amazon kills it amazon remembers and knows who you are every time you go to that site and this platform gives it that same ability. You know, you said, isn't it kind of cool when you call it? Wow, they knew I'm a Yankee fan. How did they know that? <laughs> That's right. They knew I'm a Springsteen fan. Well, I think everybody does. Um, exactly. What about uh, uh, last question on this? I mean, do you do you then bring in contextual information like weather, right? Something like that, time of day, and and feed them the right information. Like, how does that play into this as well? It's got it because. When you're talking about location, you're talking about uh, all the information that they have, and then you add this contextual layer on top of it, that must just paint such a great picture when it comes to, I could be standing in, in Times Square and say, you know, star, star, Times Square, and they'll know it's 4.30, and they'll be able to, you know, at some point be able to bring an inventory of restaurant availability or show availability. And like, does it, does that play into where you guys go? I keep asking about the future. I know you guys are still stuck no, on the no, present. It's, it's Quite all right. In fact, I'm going to have to probably end here in a minute. But let me let me give you an example. Um, I got a great group of people. We got 40 plus, just about 40 people at Zoom in Palo Alto and a couple other places across the country. 
Uh, and they, we can't help ourselves. Every day we're, we, we're, we're messing around with the platform. And, you know, even we, we do our, our, our town hall meetings, people are just throwing ideas. We could do this, this, this. And one of my favorite is uh, my head of product, a guy named Jim Stanley, comes into my office one day. And he says, we got this crazy idea. Uh, and uh, want to know if we can turn up Star Star Santa. I said, what? He said, yeah. He said, these guys in it. We came up with this crazy idea. Wouldn't it be cool if we could virally promote to parents they could simply call Star Star Santa 48 hours before Christmas Day. And then we took that, you know, that Google a North Star map yeah. that shows you where Santa Claus is in the world. And then we basically serve that content onto the phone based on time of day, to your point, weather, that kind of stuff. So yes, yes, yes. All that's possible. And and we actually at this point we've been serving so much, uh, Rob, on the brand to the client side. But an option we do have, though, is to think about what kind of services and content, contextual relevance could you build that go well beyond you know, what brands may want to do or even the customer relationship management guys want to do. But as I keep telling you know, my board and my investors, um, that's a nice option. Focus. <laughs> stay, on, stay on what's making money now and stay on, uh, on the path. And I, I appreciate that joke because it's um, as an entrepreneur, you, I mean, it's entrepreneur ADHD, right? Where you, you, uh, you see the shiny new object and you say, well, that sounds great. Let's just do it. And, and it derails companies. So, uh, I mean, strong leaders mean, mean strong vision, meaning sticking to that vision uh, with a little bit, being a little bit malleable when the time comes and when the need arises. But I, I love the fact that, yeah, you know, we can talk about these, but look, we've still got this, we got this driving mission that we have to, we have to achieve. All right. I've taken, I've taken this full time with you. I, I need, where do we send people? What's the best place for people to, to go to the one spot where we should send them so that they can uh, find more information about what you guys are doing? www.zoo.com. Yeah. So that's Z or Z, depending on what country you're in. O O V E dot com. Go and check it out, and and you can see if your your uh, star star number is available. The pricing is up there, and uh, and some great examples, some videos from uh, campaigns from the NFL. From I mean, I, I've thrown it up a couple of times on the screen, and I'll do it again. If you go to uh, zoove.com or starstar.co, you will find everything that you need to know about this company. Two years later, I love the fact that uh, that you guys are uh, you know progressing so exceptionally well. Uh, and I really appreciate you spending this much time with me, Joe. I really do appreciate you uh, sharing what you what you've what you've done over the last two years. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. I really appreciate it as well. We have been speaking with Joe Gillespie, who is the president and CEO of Zoove. Go to zoove.com. Uh, I really appreciate the fact that you guys have stuck around. Thank you so much for being here. It means so much the fact that you spend a little bit of your day, wherever you are, whatever you're doing, with me here at Untether.tv. We'll see you next time for the next episode on Untether.tv. Joe, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Thanks, Rob. Take care. Bye-bye.